Today, I share some of my own research that I published this year. Keep listening on for all those details only here on the People Scientist Podcast. Listening to the People Scientist, the podcast dedicated to helping us optimize our health with the latest scientific findings on neuroscience, physiology, and nutrition. I, your host, Dr. Stephanie Caligiuri, a nutritionist, physiologist, and neuroscientist, will be here with you every single week, bringing us information to ignite our thinking to help us be one step closer to the healthiest we can be. Hello, my People Scientist Army, and welcome back to the People Scientist Podcast for episode 138. For every episode, it is my goal to empower all of us with some scientific information that is understandable, relatable, and actionable, so that we can feel like we've become a little bit smarter and a little bit healthier with every new episode. How are you feeling today? I hope that you are doing well. And thank you for inviting me into your day. And I hope that I can share with you something interesting to ponder with this episode. So what are we going to be talking about today? Well, today is a very special episode because I'm going to be sharing with you some of my very own research. In the last few months, two of my studies where I'm the first author were published. One study is a clinical trial that has to do with metabolomics, nutrition, the fats in our body, and cigarette smoking. The second study has to do with the neuroscience of nicotine addiction, and I cannot wait to share these results with you. But before I get into that, as we always do, let's start off with a foregone fact where I share scientific finding from long ago. Faulkner in the journal JAMA back in 1933 spoke of a very rare case where a man was exposed to a high dose of nicotine. Now, this particular patient was a 35-year-old man. He was a florist, and every day he would prepare a solution of nicotine to spray his plants with as an insecticide. Now, he worked with a stock solution of 40% nicotine that he would then dilute in order to use as an insecticide for his plants. But one day, he accidentally spilled the 40% solution and he sat down on the solution without realizing. He went about his day thinking that the pants would just dry out. About 15 minutes after sitting on the 40% nicotine solution, the man began to sweat. He had labored breathing, he felt very dizzy, became very nauseous and vomited. A doctor was called and the man passed out and became comatose. He was in a coma for three hours. He was monitored and given caffeine sodiobenzoate. Now, caffeine sodiobenzoate is interesting because back then it was used as a first line of treatment for patients with slow or suppressed breathing that would occur from drinking too much alcohol or from taking too many pain medications like opioids. So they suspected that perhaps this was the case for him and gave him this to help increase his breathing rate. The next day, about 24 hours after this incident, the patient felt fine, and they wound up discharging him. Interestingly, his clothing was kept in a bag, and his clothing still happened to be damp with that 40% nicotine solution. He put those same clothes back on. Soon after leaving the hospital, he had to return back to the hospital again, because that 40% nicotine solution on his pants entered his bloodstream through his skin again. After a day or so, the nicotine cleared from his body, and he felt relatively well again. Three weeks later, he seemed to appear in good health, but he said he could no longer use nicotine spray for for his plants as an insecticide anymore at his flower shop, because the smell would make him feel instantly nauseous again. Now that is what we call conditioned aversion. Aversion being to feel averse, the negative feeling to avoid something. The brain was smart enough to associate that smell of the nicotine with being sick and therefore preventing him from being around nicotine again. 
Now, this concept of conditioned aversion was realized back then, and we're still studying it today. In fact, I'm going to be getting into more details of that in a little bit. So there's our foregone fact for today. Now, how about we get into the core takeaways of today's topic, where I share some of my own research from this year. It is possible that we are born with slight genetic differences, called alleles or SNPs, that put us at a higher risk for addiction. For example, let's say that there are two people. They both smoke a cigarette for the first time. One person feels nauseous and lightheaded. The other person feels only the good, pleasurable effects of the nicotine. The person that feels only the pleasurable effects and not those negative, aversive effects is far more likely to develop an addiction to nicotine. And our genetics can potentially predict that response. So in this publication that I'm going to share with you today, we dive into a particular protein that is densely expressed in the middle of our brain that seems to regulate this negative, protective response against nicotine addiction. The other study that I'm going to share with you today highlights the use of metabolomics and how certain fats in our circulation may put individuals at a higher risk for clogged arteries. Certain oxidized fats are elevated with cigarette smoking, and that can put us at an even higher risk for heart disease and vascular disease. I discuss ways to potentially reduce levels of these oxidized fats, such as cooking with oils low in polyunsaturated fatty acids, eating flaxseed, avoiding fried and processed foods, and eating a diet rich in antioxidants. Now, let's get into those scientific details. If you have been a listener for a while of the podcast, then you know that I started out this podcast with more of a nutrition focus, because at the time, that was my specialty. I conducted clinical trials aiming to see if different diets or foods could help patients with heart disease and kidney disease. However, it was during those trials that I realized even if I found a great nutritional strategy to help improve our health, that if we couldn't stick to that healthy routine, it would not be effective. I realized too that the majority of chronic diseases that ail us today and ailed my study participants were behavior related. For example, we know that we should not eat donuts every day. We know that we should not drink six ounces of whiskey every day. We know that we should not smoke cigarettes every day, but we still might. Why? That is when I transitioned to behavioral neuroscience. I wanted to understand why we do what we do. Why do we eat unhealthy foods, even though we know the consequences? Why do we smoke or drink copious amounts of alcohol? So I ventured into behavioral neuroscience to try to use our brain to our advantage. And that is what I've been studying for the last six years. So naturally, this is why the podcast has shifted more toward neuroscience and psychology over the last couple of years. I have a handful of different projects in the lab where I study alcohol use disorder, compulsive eating, opioid addiction, and nicotine addiction. And today, I'm going to be talking about two studies that are recently published about nicotine. First, let's talk about the clinical trial, and then I will get more into this specific neurobiological study. This clinical trial was published in the journal Metabolites this year. This was in collaboration with Harold Alkema, Amira Vandy, and Grant Pierce at St. Boniface Hospital in Winnipeg, Canada. And we conducted a clinical trial with 118 participants. 98 participants were living with a disease called peripheral artery disease, which is often abbreviated PAD. Then we also had 20 participants that had no history of a diagnosis of any disease or condition, and they served as the control comparator group. So peripheral artery disease, or PAD, is when we have arteries in our arms and legs that become narrowed by an atherosclerotic plaque. Now, this can put pressure on our heart to try to pump blood through that narrowed artery. Now, to explain that, let me give an analogy. Imagine that we are outside and we have a water pump. 
and the job of this water pump is to pump through five liters of water in one minute through this flexible large garden hose. Now the water pump can do that job quite easily because that's what it's meant to do. But now imagine instead of a garden hose attached to the water pump, it is now a very narrow and stiff straw. But the water pump still has to do its same job. It still has to pump five liters of water through the straw in one minute. So what do you think will happen to the water pump? Eventually it will have to work much harder to do so, but then it will eventually fail. Now this is an analogy for our heart as the water pump and our blood vessels as the garden hose or the narrow straw. When we develop atherosclerosis or plaques or clogged arteries, they become narrowed and stiff. And as a result, our heart or the water pump has to work so much harder to pump the blood through those narrowed stiff arteries. And as a result, that puts a lot of stress on the heart. The heart may enlarge over time, and that is when cardiac hypertrophy, heart attack, or heart failure may occur. So as a result, preventing clogged arteries, preventing atherosclerotic plaque is of key interest to scientists and medical professionals. So as a result, unfortunately, individuals that are living with peripheral artery disease, which is when there are arteries that are clogged in the arms or legs, they are at a higher risk for heart attack and stroke more so than the average individual. Now we don't entirely understand what causes peripheral artery disease, but we do understand that smoking cigarettes seems to be highly related. For example, Lou in the journal Heart in 2014 reported that individuals who smoke cigarettes are at a three times higher risk of developing peripheral artery disease versus individuals who have never smoked. Now, over the years, considerable data has been published to illustrate that smoking can increase the risk of clogged arteries, called atherosclerosis. For example, Messner in 2014 reported that cigarette smoking can cause endothelial dysfunction. What this means is that cigarette smoke can cause the inner lining of our blood vessels to become unhealthy. The cells that line the inside of our blood vessels change in a way that increases inflammation and constriction of the blood vessels. So it's like the analogy of instead of a garden hose being attached to the water pump, it's now a narrow, stiff straw. Cigarette smoking may also cause the fats circulating around in our body to become oxidized. Now when these fats become oxidized, they become very active. For example, imagine Clark Kent changing into his Superman outfit. He can do so much more after he transforms. So too can the oxidized fats. But what these oxidized fats can do is either good or bad for our health. Now part of my job is to figure out which ones are good and which ones are bad, and what exactly it is that they are trying to do. Now there is a portion of patients with peripheral artery disease that have never smoked cigarettes. And so I was curious what caused their peripheral artery disease to develop then. So I had two main questions for this paper that we'd published in Metabolites. One, how did cigarette smoking history impact their oxidized fats called the oxylipidome? This specifically includes oxylipins and oxidized phosphatidylcholines. And second, how did this oxylipidome profile differ from people who have a history of smoking cigarettes versus people who have never smoked cigarettes? Now, one of my areas of expertise is metabolomics. This technique has been around for many years, but is really gaining popularity in the last year. Now, within this patient cohort, we collected blood samples and their medical history. And I used the technique of metabolomics to quantify these specific and different oxidized fats. And there are hundreds of different oxidized fats within our body. So what did we find out? Firstly, in individuals living with peripheral artery disease, they had approximately a four-fold higher level of total plasma oxylipins versus the control group. So this highlights how oxidation of fatty acids in the body is quite different between individuals with peripheral artery disease and individuals that don't have any disease. This supports the notion that oxidation of fat may be a contributing factor for this disease. So what can we do to prevent this? Well, oxidation of fatty acids is complex. Sometimes it results in helpful molecules and sometimes not so helpful molecules. But if I had to simplify some suggestions for all of us, it would be this. 
one to reduce the consumption of fried foods as frying of foods may induce peroxidation of lipids if we want to cook with a fat or oil my suggestion is to use an oil low in polyunsaturated fatty acids as these are less likely to produce lipid peroxides so oils low in polyunsaturated fatty acids to cook with include olive oil avocado oil and coconut oil now some people have asked me about butter or an animal fat Typically, butter and animal fats are quite rich in arachidonic acid, which is prone to peroxidation and oxidation as well because it's quite rich in polyunsaturated fatty acids. So my suggestion is still to cook with oils that are lower in polyunsaturated fatty acids as they are less likely to produce these lipid peroxides. Now, oils rich in omega-3s like flaxseed oil, for example, are healthy but should not be heated. They should be consumed fresh. This is why we often see on, on a label like a flaxseed oil, cold pressed. The reason why companies will use cold pressing and label it that way is because other methods of oil extraction can produce heat. And heat is a potential cause of oxidation of the fats within the oil, which is bad. So cold pressing is meant to prevent this. So cold pressed flaxseed oil could be of benefit to our heart health. In particular, I published another clinical trial, actually a few clinical trials, where we found that three tablespoons of ground flaxseed eaten per day lowered the concentration of many oxidized lipids and also reduced blood pressure in patients with high blood pressure. Again, eating the flaxseed uncooked or just lightly cooked is best. If the flaxseed is mixed into a batter, the quality of the omega-3 seems to be better preserved versus frying or putting the seeds directly on a frying pan, as the high heat and the direct exposure to heat, again, could cause breakdown or oxidation of the omega-3 fatty acids, which is bad. My last suggestion to prevent oxidation of fats in our body is to consume antioxidant-rich foods and to avoid oxidants in our environment the best we can. This means eating fresh fruits and vegetables and avoiding cigarette smoking, vaping, air pollution, avoiding high sugar intake, and avoiding high processed foods to the best of our ability. Okay, what was the second finding from this clinical trial? We noted that in individuals living with peripheral artery disease, if they quit smoking, there were some changes noted in the oxidized fats in their blood. For example, we saw significantly lower levels of some omega-6 fatty acid-derived oxylipins, greater levels of omega-3 fatty acid-derived oxylipins, greater levels of non-fragmented oxidized phosphatidylcholines. So what does this mean? Well, it appears that quitting smoking results in a potential improvement in the profile of oxidized lipids circulating in the patient's blood. So further data to support that quitting smoking may help reduce the progression of atherosclerosis and peripheral artery disease severity. The third thing that we found that was really interesting was that we wanted to look at this small group of patients that were living with peripheral artery disease but had never smoked. Now, this is an interesting group of patients because smoking is so closely tied to the cause of peripheral artery disease. So if they never smoked, then it raises the question, how did they develop peripheral artery disease? Well, in their blood, I noted they had about 30% higher levels of fragmented oxidized phosphatidylcholines in their blood. This is important to note because the type of oxidized fat that can be particularly negative is this type, and that is because of its role in atherosclerosis or the development of plaques in the arteries. So it appears that this class of molecules can be a potential cause of peripheral artery disease in patients who have never smoked. This is supported by previous data as well. So this raises the question if we can target these specific lipids to prevent or treat peripheral artery disease. This is partly what our work will continue to find out. I would postulate that perhaps something in their lifestyle increased the oxidation of fats that was not cigarette smoke. Or perhaps they were, were around secondhand smoke a lot. Perhaps they were living in an area of high air pollution. Perhaps they consumed a very unhealthy diet for years. Or perhaps they had a genetic predisposition. Unfortunately, we don't have enough data on this patient cohort to answer this, but it is intriguing that we have a potential mechanism, which is these oxidized phosphatidylcholines, which now gives us a target to help patients with peripheral artery disease, particularly patients 
that have never smoked. So if we can formulate a medicine or a nutritional intervention like flaxseed to target these oxidized lipids, then that could be of benefit. So the overall summary of this study published in Metabolites this year is that oxidized lipids seem to be associated with peripheral artery disease. We call this the oxylipidome. So the oxylipidome links cigarette smoking to PAD. If an individual quits smoking, we see an improvement in their oxylipidome profile. And in patients that are living with peripheral artery disease that never smoked, we now have a target as oxidized, fragmented phosphatidylcholines can be targeted now as a new therapeutic strategy. Now let's get into the second paper. We published this one out of Mount Sinai Hospital in the journal The Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences this year. It is entitled, Hedgehog Interacting Protein Acts in the Habenula to Regulate Nicotine Intake. This is where I dive into the fine details of neurobiology and genetics in the context of nicotine addiction. So currently I am an instructor and neuroscientist working in the lab led by Paul Kenny at Mount Sinai Hospital. And Paul and his team approach drug addiction from multiple perspectives, but one of those perspectives is aversion. Aversion meaning a negative feeling, bad feeling, a feeling of nausea, queasiness, lightheadedness that we might feel when we take too much of a drug. For example, the first time someone smokes a cigarette, if it makes them feel sick, they are far less likely to become addicted to nicotine. If by chance that individual does become addicted to nicotine, they are far less likely to become a heavy user and are more likely to be a casual user of nicotine. What we are realizing is that our genetics can influence this aversive response and therefore the likelihood of developing an addiction. This is why we study drug aversion. Drug aversion is the safety protective response of the brain saying, hey, this could be harmful, stop consuming it. So the brain therefore sends a signal of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, etc. to prevent us from consuming more and to eliminate that substance from the body. Much like the case study I shared in the foregone fact. Now we have learned in our lab that certain brain regions regulate this aversive response to nicotine. This includes the medial habenula that sits in the middle of our brain, the interpeduncular nucleus that sits a little bit further back, and my favorite brain region that you often hear me speaking about, the nucleus of the tractus solitarius. It sits at the back of our brain. So in the study we published in PNAS, we focus upon the medial habenula. Now my friend Matt and I on this project began it by looking at a list of genes that were associated with respiratory diseases like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema, and lung cancer. We, now, we all have slight differences in our genetic code, and it is our job as scientists to find out if those slight differences put us at risk for disease or if those differences in our genetics are beneficial. What Matt and I realized is that there are slight genetic differences in a gene called hedgehog interacting protein, or HHIP, and that seemed to be associated with the increased risk of lung disease. Now, for a long time, scientists speculated that this connection existed because of the importance that HHIP plays in lung development early on in life. And although that is likely true, our group is postulating another potential mechanism. Now, guess where HHIP is densely expressed in the brain? You may have guessed it. It is in one of these brain regions that regulates nicotine aversion, the medial habenula. So we speculated that individuals born with these slight differences in the genetic code for hedgehog interacting protein, or HHIP, that they might be at a higher risk for lung disease because it is influencing their nicotine aversion. And therefore, they may be at a higher risk for developing nicotine addiction if it is reducing their negative effects from smoking. So when someone is smoking a cigarette or when they're vaping nicotine, if they feel no negative effects, if they feel no aversive effects, and they only feel the positive effects, then they are far more likely to use nicotine heavily and far more likely to develop dependence upon it. So we conducted a ton of detailed experiments in preclinical models where we deleted or knocked down a chip in the medial habenula of the brain using CRISPR gene editing. We had shown that this altered the messages that were being sent in the brain, and this resulted in 
less of that negative feeling or aversion associated with nicotine in the mice. As a result, when mice could, were allowed to press a lever to receive a dose of intravenous nicotine, in the mice where we had deleted HHIP in the medial habenula, those mice took far higher amounts of nicotine than the control mice. We also found specifically that when HHIP was not working properly in the medial habenula of the brain, acetylcholine signaling was disrupted, and this seemed to be dependent on cholesterol in the cell membrane. So the function of different lipids or fats within the brain is also important here and an area of future research. So overall, we show that the association of HHIP to lung disease in humans is likely not only due to the importance of HHIP in lung development, but can also be due to the important role that HHIP plays in the medial habenula for regulating nicotine aversion. Because perhaps in individuals that are born with this slight genetic difference in HHIP, when they smoke a cigarette, they may feel no negative effects, and so as a result, are going to smoke far more cigarettes than someone else. As a result, that may impact their lung health far more over time. So what can we take from these findings? What does it mean? Well, genetic testing for SNPs or genetic alleles is becoming quite common practice and is commercially available. If individuals perhaps do that genetic testing and they note they, that they have certain genetic alleles or differences in the gene A chip, then they could consider avoiding nicotine products altogether so they don't have that higher risk of developing the nicotine dependence. They could also place more emphasis on their lung health by getting good aerobic exercise, avoiding air pollution if possible. And we don't know if these measures are sufficient enough to prevent lung disease in this population, but these are all good measures that are sure to be of benefit in one way or another. So that is a wrap, my People Scientist Army, an update on some of my own recent publications. From our study published in Metabolites, we used the technique of metabolomics to highlight the importance of oxidized fats in peripheral artery disease. From these data, I can suggest that avoiding fried foods, cooking with oils low in polyunsaturated fatty acids like olive oil, avocado oil, and coconut oil, consuming ground flaxseed and other sources of omega-3 fatty acids may be of benefit to the plasma oxylipidome and therefore heart and vascular health. We now have new therapeutic targets from this plasma oxylipidome in order to further investigate in peripheral artery disease. Interestingly, in that small group of individuals that had never smoked cigarettes that developed peripheral artery disease, it appears that a certain class of fats called oxidized fragmented phosphatidylcholines may be of particular interest. In the second study we published in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences this year, we highlight the importance of genetics in regulating that aversive or negative feeling that we may experience when we consume nicotine. How this aversive response is important in determining the likelihood that we may develop an addiction. Specifically, the gene HIP, which is expressed in the medial habenule of the brain, may play a role in nicotine aversion and therefore nicotine-taking behavior. This could explain the connection HIP has to lung disease. If someone has a genetic difference, a SNP, or an allele in the HIP gene, they should consider avoiding nicotine and can consider putting an emphasis on their lung health. So I hope that this episode was interesting and informative for all of you. If you want to see the papers that I cite in this episode, if you want to catch some extra information that I share on the week's topic, or if you want to message me, then feel free to follow me on social media. My handles are in the description box to this episode. If you have the choice, I use Instagram the most. If you by chance want to buy me a coffee to say thanks for the show, there are links in the description box to help you do that. I hope that you all have a wonderful two weeks, and I look forward to meeting you all back here for another episode in two weeks' time. Bye for now. I am a scientist simply sharing scientific evidence. Some of the clinical interventions I discuss are not appropriate for everyone. Before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle, please do consult the advice of your physician or dietitian. My opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of Mount Sinai Hospital and its affiliates. Thank you.